Shalom. Shalom. Tom's been trying to coach me all morning. It was actually the computer program that that it, that, it, that, 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 that worked. Uh, don't all computer programs have <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm much more happy to be back here than even Paul is to have me, uh, very sincerely. Uh, first of all, uh, if you're going to intentionally use a cryptic title, you should probably at least show your audience the common courtesy of a subtitle that actually tells you what I'm going to talk about. Uh, so that's natural selection, religious traditions, and long-term descendant-leaving success. And like a growing number of social scientists, I use natural selection to try to explain religious behavior. What makes me a bit different, and actually I've found the word is fringe uh, among this group, is that I think traditional religions can give insights that can actually improve evolutionary explanations of religious traditions. And let me just explain a couple of things about this sentence, okay? First of all, the word better. One of the first things I suggest to students in my classes is to the extent possible, distinguish between is statements, that is statements about how the world is, how do humans behave, <laughs> These are statements that may be testable or not, and if testable, they may be true or false. But distinguish those from should statements, statements that make moral judgments, that make, you know, people should do this or should do that. By my use of the word better there, better evolutionary explanations, I'm only in the realm of is statements. By better explanations, I just mean more accurate, uh, they're testable, and they pass the test. I'm not saying anything about that if they're good or that you should agree with them or that they mean anything about how you should behave. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. Uh, the second is uh, the term uh, traditional religions. Uh, I'm a cultural anthropologist and what I study primarily is traditional in the sense of small scale, usually uh, foragers, kinship-based, sometimes people would use the word tribal, okay? That's what I study in terms of traditional religions. And I mention that because, dawned on me today, I may know less about Judaism than anyone currently in Israel. If you can find someone who knows less, did you notice the mispronunciation of shalom to be in there just, just to prove it, okay? So, uh, you might be wondering, well, well, why am I here at all? Well, it's because of the, uh, excuse me, uh, title of the paper, the cryptic one. The only reason I'm here is that Rick Goldberg emailed me about six years ago and said, do you know anyone doing some research on traditional religions, particularly Judaism, but anything there, uh, have this foundation that would like to fund them? And I said, well, I'm planning to study something called moral elevation. Okay? And what that is, is have you ever seen or even heard someone doing something really noble and altruistic for someone, maybe risking their life to pull someone off a, a train track? And you get kind of a, a certain feeling, kind of warm, maybe choked up, teared up or something. Well, the interesting thing is that psychologists have called it moral elevation. And not only do you feel that way, psychologists have found repeatedly you become more likely to do altruistic acts yourself. Okay, and I said, I've been studying that you have these stories about these morally elevating acts in every traditional culture that I've looked at. I'm planning to do some research uh, on how are these acts found in a modern American society. And I'm thinking of looking at war memorials because that seems to be, uh, in traditional cultures, it's in that context that you hear these morally elevating stories of giving one's life for others. And Rick said, hmm, have you ever heard of Yad Vashem? 
nope. I think the email was like, well, why don't you, you know, Google it and get back to me. <laughs> well, it took about a second to see the full title of Yad Vashem and see the words like heroes and martyrs and remembrance. I knew, okay, there's something going on here about morally elevating stories. And it took about three seconds to come to the righteous among the nations the title given to non-Jews by Yad Vashem who risked their life to attempt to save Jews during the Holocaust. So I think I emailed back something, it's probably a very professional message, but the gist was, yes, Rick, please fund me. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. So I went around to kind of all the major Holocaust museums in North America, Europe, and Israel that I could find to see how the righteous among the nations were portrayed and did they seem to be portrayed in a way to morally elevate people. We wrote that report, you know, that was the first year, you know, okay, this is what I did and, and Rick sent an email back and said, oh, you know, the, the, the board liked that, but what would be more important is for you to focus on specifically Muslims and or Arabs who risked their life to save Jews during the Holocaust. And particularly, any memorials or museums recognizing them in Muslim or Arab countries. And in fact, they thought it was so important that they said, I remember this precisely because it's so different, we'll cover whatever expenses are needed for you to go there. Not that I don't always get these offers, but no. <laughs> and I had this strange emotional roller coaster ride, you know, this, I, I can't believe it. And then slowly part of my brain calculated, so where might I have to go? <laughs> and the, my wife is not going to like this. <laughs> okay. so, but we did. So we went and did that research. So what I know about Judaism only comes from whatever was very directly related to that. And I probably misunderstood almost everything in that category. So, what I'm going to do today is suggest to you that from what little I know, maybe, possibly, perhaps, Judaism contains two insights, not into evolutionary theory per se, but just into human behavior and kind of human nature, that could really contribute to evolutionary theory to make better explanations of human behavior. First insight concerns, this might seem like an uninteresting question, hopefully it will not turn out to be, when is evolutionary success best measure, measured? Uh, in this case, this insight, uh, the answer to this question, is missing from evolutionary theory, despite the fact that evolutionary theorists in the 1970s seem to have figured this out. And no one has really rejected it since, the answer Judaism, I think, has come up with. But they just haven't seen it important in evolutionary theory, so they've kind of disregarded it and kind of forgotten about it. Okay? So reintroducing it, I think, from Judaism would help. The second insight contain, con, uh, concerns the nature of culture. And by culture, I simply mean socially learned behavior, or to put it even more simply, copy behavior. Okay. And in this case, the Judaism insight is missing from evolutionary bi biology, despite the fact that humans, I think, have known what Judaism still seems to know for tens of thousands of years. Okay. But in the 1980s, social scientists came to reject this insight and to very explicitly say it was not true. Okay. Why do I bother with this? Because I suggest that when these two insights are combined and then integrated back into evolutionary theory, they can explain some very puzzling types of behavior, including very puzzling types of altruism or sacrifice for others. Okay, when to measure evolutionary success? Okay. Believe it or not, this became a real point of discussion in the 1970s. Richard Alexander, biologist, 
put it this way. Now, it might seem at first that it's easy. Evolution, natural selection favors number of offspring. But, you know, a trait that maximizes number of offspring wouldn't be as evolutionarily successful if all those offspring died right away as a trait that had fewer offspring born, but more survived, more were reared. Okay? But a trait that caused fewer offspring to survive okay, and mate would be more successful than a trait that had lots of offspring grow up to adulthood but not find mates. But what would be even more successful, what would be a better measurement, is for those who had matings actually produce fertile offspring. But what would be even better than that would be to produce fertile offspring that survived and so on and so forth. Okay? Uh, once you kind of realize the dilemma, the question really becomes, what generation should be used to measure evolutionary success? Uh, Mary Jane West Eberhard, as part of this same kind of discussion, put it this way, maybe even more simply, is natural selection maximize children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, or so forth. Okay. Now, you can kind of tell that, that these authors are leading to the idea that there is a best measurement, and it's not just number of offspring born. But the person who put the answer that they were kind of leading up to most clearly is a person named, did I mention to keep is statements separate from should statements? For example, is it possible for someone to perhaps have should positions that you might not agree with, still happen to make another statement that actually is a true is statement? Is that possible? Okay, I remind you of that because the person who really, I think, gave the answer most clearly, his name is, any guesses? <laughs> you may not agree with some of his should positions, but I think he was right when he said, ideally we might count the relative number of descendants after a great number of generations. Now, no one fought against this, they just kind of ignored it because it's clumsy, it's inconvenient. Okay? To give an example of that, uh, 2011 article, and I just happened to use this one because it's in the major journal in this field, Evolution and Human Behavior, and it's one of those articles that's kind of a review article that says, hey, I know we disagree about things, but to make uh, progress, let's all agree that we understand the basics of evolutionary theory, okay? So, first thing we have, we all know that the currency of that natural selection cares about is the production of offspring. And only, I think, completely, maybe unintentionally, unknowingly, they do put the qualification surviving to adulthood. So this whole insight that a better measurement of evolutionary success is after many generations is essentially vanished from evolutionary explanations. But, and this is where I get to find out just how little I know about Judaism, I suggest that Judaism actually has a better understanding of when to measure success and that's from this statement. And I'm very aware that there's lots of different exact translations of this. I'm aware of some of the controversies over the meaning of it. But the meaning that I think shows an understanding of the importance of measuring long-term descendant leaving success is the one used that I know because it's the one used by Yad Vashem. Okay? And it's the quote that you've probably seen most often in relations to the righteous among the nations. This is from the Yad Vashem webpage. The significance of this saying is demonstrated when the children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren come together because it's not only the survivor that was saved by the rescuer, and instead of really saying an entire family, the more accurate thing would be a potentially unlimited number of generations of descendants. <coughs> I don't know if it's happened yet, but if not, it will. You'll start seeing great-great-grandchildren showing up at these, and that may have already happened. Okay? Now, 
it's kind of interesting that Judaism understands this, while evolutionary theory has forgotten it because Yad Vashem goes on to add kind of what happened before this saving of one life. Okay? <clears throat> that the survivors and their children represent the only remaining living branch of a once large extended family. Okay? <clears throat> What's interesting is that this describes one of the most common basic evolutionary concepts. Okay? So evolutionists should be aware of this, but no, it's Judaism. Uh, this is a microevolutionary bottleneck. Okay? And this has been part of evolutionary theory forever, I mean, since Darwin. Okay? The only kind of difference is by micro level, you're really focusing on individuals and their descendants. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> that is, and it's an event then when low reproductive success can be followed by or leads to excuse me, <clears throat> high descendant leaving success. Okay. Now just to give you an idea of how basic and for how long this concept has been in evolutionary theory, if you go back to kind of a famous uh, diagram by Ernst Haeckel in 1910, okay, you will see an evolutionary uh, bottleneck in its significance. Say you look at these three genetic lines or lineages, and you wonder, which one of these is being favored by natural selection? Which one is winning? If you just look the next generation, it would look like, well, the winners are number one and number three, say they've had two offspring. Number two has only had one. But if you wait another generation, not only is number three no longer winning, it's out of the game, okay? And now there's a tie between one and two. If you look a few more generations, One's out of the game, and the winner is number two. And as time goes on, the ability of that lineage to have low reproductive success followed by huge long-term descendant leaving success becomes very clear. And this is not just a unique one-time event. If you look at his whole diagram, you see it is filled, even in this lineage there that I looked at, with multiple bottlenecks, okay? If you were to look at the fine-grained micro-level, what's actually happening with individuals reproducing, it would really be filled with bottlenecks. Examples when low, reproduc low de reproductive success is followed by very high descendant leaving success. So it's kind of puzzling why evolutionary theory would have not seen this as being important. Another interesting question though, and this is one that I hope you will be able to tell me if, if you think this is plausible or not. How has Judaism had this insight? Okay. I mean, they didn't experience the Holocaust and then go, hey, you know, low reproductive success might be followed by high descent leaving success. That saying predates the Holocaust by a great deal. How would they have had that saying to apply to the Holocaust? Well, as some of you know, Certain lineage of Judaism have experienced bottlenecks. For example, a recent study suggests that perhaps Akhenazi Jews experienced a bottleneck of only 350 individuals. So that had to happen, but still doesn't count for why would you still have this saying to apply to the Holocaust? Well, not only did that happen, but most likely, probably like in many, if not all, human ancestry, you had numerous bottlenecks. Okay? Uh, the difference is, the reason that Judaism might have a clearer interest in this than others is, they talked about it. They told stories about it. These things happened. And these stories then were there to apply to a new situation. These are stories of times from low reproductive success were followed by high descendant leaving success. Thus, if you realize this, what evolutionary theorists should and whatever Judaism appears to, 
It implies that the ideal way to measure evolutionary success is over a great number of generations. Insight two into the nature of culture. My prediction is that this next statement will not seem bizarre to you. We'll see. During the time that natural selection was favoring culture, culture was traditional. What I mean by that is traditional culture are those behaviors socially learned, copied from parents, from ancestors, as opposed to being copied from other people. That would be non-traditional culture. Okay? Now, this was common news, I think, to humans in general, and uh, even until fairly recently, uh, the folklorist uh, Simon Bonner pointed out in the 19th century, ethnology, which is another word for cultural anthropology, and folklore were the science of tradition. You know, there's this kind of general, yes, culture was tended to be traditional. Okay? Even as cultural anthropologists in the early 1920s who are seeing more change, more non-traditional culture, traditions changing faster and therefore no longer being traditional, still observed that most culture was still traditional. Okay? As things have continued, technological change, this may no longer be true, but everyone seemed to be agreed that in the past, culture was traditional. That's important because it's referring to when natural selection favored cultural behavior. It was favoring traditions. Okay? All this changed in the 1980s. Specifically, all this changed in 1983. Okay? As Hansen writes six years later, Anthropologists, folklorists, historians, social scientists in general have become acutely aware that culture and tradition is anything but stable realities handed down one generation to the next. Instead, they have discovered, supposedly become acutely aware, that tradition is, is just a lie. It's just a false claim. People claim their behaviors have been passed down, but they haven't really. The reason for this rejection of what seems so obvious to other people was actually touched upon in the earlier talk. Okay? It was really for political, ideological reasons. It was seen that claiming that some cultures were traditional was insulting, was derogatory because of the holding that innovation, progress, was superior. Okay? This kind of an ironic argument, okay, because that's what the position of, and only of, I'd say, non-traditional cultures. So it's really an example of imposing your value system on others, and then, in hopes of not offending them, making what I would say is a complete false statement. Yes, traditions are disappearing, but the, you would not have powerful false claims of traditions unless actual traditions had been important to people. Okay? This has influenced evolutionary theorists, such as a colleague of mine at the University of Missouri, uh, Missouri Napoleon Chagnon, who wrote in what's unfortunately probably going to be his last book, okay, that yeah, it's true that humans make rules, you know, and that those rules are traditional, but what's really important, meaning what they really want to study, is not traditional rules, but the way individuals manipulate and change them. Okay? So this has led evolutionary theorists to completely ignore the traditional nature of culture. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that there's some things in Judaism that imply an understanding that some behavior was traditional. <laughs> you drawing upon what I know okay, is as you leave Yad Vashem, the way they have it situated, it's almost impossible for you not to see this. And I draw attention to the last part of this. Tell your children about it, what you've seen. And it's kind of interesting we talk about parenting styles. Notice how gentle this is. And let your children 
tell their children. You know, I guess tell them, I won't get mad if you repeat this. We'll see different ways of looking at this uh, a bit later. Okay. Now, I once thought about a couple of years ago, I thought someone else had made this connection. Someone else had used the evidence of traditions in Judaism to reintroduce traditions to evolutionary theory. Because I always, you know, looking at, at papers like this on the internet, yeah, cultural transmission in chimpanzees, and yeah, I guess I'll look at the first sentence. Okay. And this catches my eye because, well, where it comes from, yeah, it comes from ancestors. It's traditional. Maybe, just maybe, they'll say that. Probably not, but maybe. I'll read the next sentence. <laughs> okay, that's the reaction I hoped for. That was the reaction I used to get, well, no, I used to expect to get in the University of Missouri classes until I found that no one has seen <laughs> Fiddler on the Roof. <laughs> but now that I'm here, I read that. I go, oh, where does it come from? And then he's referring to Fiddler on the Roof. Yes, let it be the opening. Let it, it, it. yes, it's going to be there. Oh. And then I'm scrolling down, and the next thing I see is a, a painting, actually it's probably a, a sketching, and I happen to know the name of it. It is tradition. Is anyone familiar with this? Yes. Some of you are, okay. Now, okay, I don't, I don't know anything about the, the artist. I don't think he meant it derogatorily or insulting or anything, I, I don't know. I'm sure that Johnson in this article didn't. <laughs> Okay, it just made this connection, reintroducing traditions, or so I'm hoping, but I warn you that I can, it could be taken of offensively. So I won't show it to you, we'll just... <laughs> you want to see it now, don't you? Okay. Okay, I'm listening to every sound here. <laughs> yeah, a little offense, no? <laughs> Anyway, my just take it is that, yes, someone is going to make this argument, okay? And sure enough, there's the quote that opens Fiddler on the Roof. Traditions. Unfortunately, from the next, when Johnson starts writing, he writes this paragraph, and he's thinking he is just rephrasing the exact same thing. But there is a slight, but I would say deadly change in the wording. And I, I know it as soon as I see it. And sure enough, there's nothing about traditions the rest of the paper. Anyone notice the, the change? Traditions gets changed, I think unknowingly, to cultural. So there's, where does culture come from? The answer is not from ancestors through traditions. So I'm still here trying to make this connection. Why is it so important? When these two insights are combined, that natural selection favors long-term descendant leaving success, and natural selection favored, when it favored culture, it was favoring traditional culture, help explain puzzling forms of altruism. We go back to this Statement seen as a statement, a story repeated generation to generation. Okay. And what its message is, what it's describing, is the fact that low reproductive success may be followed by lead to high descendant leaving success. Now, language, I suggest, is not just to express some ideas, it's done to influence people. So the question might be, you know, how would this saying influence each generation who hears it? And it may just seem that, you know, things are bad, you know, keep good spirits, things may get better. But I suggest it's more than that. It's really telling someone that in some situations, engaging in behaviors that lower their reproductive success should be done, it's the should statement, because they might produce higher descendant leaving success. And specifically, this is the context in its use with the righteous among the nations. In fact, you do not 
qualify for righteous among the nations simply for saving a Jew during the Holocaust. You have to show that you sacrificed to do it. There are many people who are nominated but are not awarded because although they save lives. Okay? And in fact, the actual saving of a life isn't necessary. What is necessary is you had to make extreme sacrifice in an attempt to save a life. Okay. So that's why this is really a saying that encourages people to engage in serious sacrifice, even ones that will reduce their reproductive success. But it has been successfully passed down many generations because in some circumstances it can have the consequence of higher descendant leaving success. So what they're saying really kind of meant is whoever sacrifices in some situations may kind of counterintuitively save an entire universe of descendants. A major sacrifice is going to be a sacrifice of reproductive success, perhaps including in the case of the righteous among the nations, at least a risk of losing your own life and or the life of your offspring, your family. But that that may it's encouraged to lead to an entire universe, many descendants. Okay? And they may be your own descendants if you sacrifice one offspring, but in a way that helps your others. But even sacrificing your only offspring might have the consequence of increasing the descendant leaving success of an earlier ancestor who started the tradition. Okay? Now, there is a concept in evolutionary theory that can explain how this would work, how it would be favored by natural selection. It's known as the parental manipulation of altruism hypothesis, uh, stated for, by one from, again, Mary Jane West Eberhard. Okay. According to this explanation, altruism can sometimes, no longer in this case, is there the just letting your offspring you know, repeat the behavior now forcing the offspring, we could take some intermediate words such as influence the individual offspring, to engage in more altruism, in fact, in altruism that is actually disadvantageous to the inclusive fitness, the reproductive success of that offspring. That could be favored by natural selection because it could increase the descendant leaving success of the ancestor. The simplest uh, example of this is that two full siblings here Offspring of the common ancestor, on average related by 0.5, should value their sibling half as much as they value themselves. But natural selection would favor a parent who could pass a tradition, notice the arrow turns blue, that influences that sibling to value its sibling as much as it values or loves itself. And that would benefit, that would hurt this offspring, but it would benefit the evolutionary success of the uh, ancestor. Okay. How could this be done? Well, you could use language again and say something like, love my other descendants as much as you love yourself. Now this is pretty accepted in evolutionary theory, but it doesn't seem to be that important because no one's considered what happens when this encouragement of altruism gets repeated. Okay? You could simply add something like, Influence your offspring to be altruistic, to value all my other descendants. Oh, and repeat it to the next generation. When this happens, it can cause natural selection to favor traditional forms of altruism that decrease reproductive success but increase descendant leaving success. Okay. Real quickly to see how this would happen, say if this is an ancestor who has three offspring, five grandchildren, seven great-grandchildren without, say, passing on any traditions. How could a tradition that increases <coughs> descendant leaving success by decreasing reproductive success, what would that look like? Well, say the parent tells the offspring, be willing to sacrifice your reproductive success for your, uh, my other descendants, these blue arrows being these traditions. Most typically, what you see in traditional cultures, the most likely this would be happen, go sacrifice your life in warfare. Okay? Uh, this could have the consequence, it's reduced uh, reproductive success, but by winning, 
okay, and therefore maybe opening new resources, could lead to greater number of descendants, could be several generations before it happens again, or it could happen the next generation again. Someone is influenced by the tradition to sacrifice the reproductive success, could lead to greater descendant leaving success, even if, say in that case, okay, it's the individual's only offspring, they're giving up their entire reproductive success, if it influences the greater descendant leaving success of the ancestor, that tradition would be favored by natural selection. This generates this counterintuitive prediction. The traditions will encourage individuals to be willing to sacrifice the reproductive success, that is perhaps to sacrifice their own life and or the life of their offspring. Now again, the ethnographic literature is filled with traditional stories encouraging people to give their life in battle. But are there any stories that seem to be encouraging someone to be willing to sacrifice the life of their offspring? Maybe? The words that go along with this, notice that there's a cause and effect by showing your willingness to sacrifice your reproductive success. You'll be rewarded not with your offspring inheriting the cities of the enemies. And I think it's pretty clearly implied after many generations, perhaps your descendants will. This has puzzled both evolutionary theorists and, and others as to what's going on here. Some evolutionists, such as uh, Stephen Marx, has said, ah, no problem, this makes perfect evolutionary sense. It simply affirms evolution's positive outcome of reproductive success. That's the reward. Okay? Others have pointed out, such as Carol Delaney, no, this doesn't make sense. If the goal was to promote re reproductive success, you would not be encouraging the willingness to sacrifice the child but to protect it. I suggest to you the answer, the solution to this is that evolution's positive outcome is not reproductive success. It's descendant leaving success. And that the sacrifice of reproductive success can be evolutionarily successful when it becomes traditional. Now, back to the original cryptic title. It's just the righteous among the nations in a sense, saved an entire universe by willing to sacrifice their own lives, and the lives of their families, that is, their reproductive success. So, is there any evidence that righteous among the nations were actually influenced by such traditions of sacrifice? And I'm just going to give two uh, findings here from the studies done with the interviews of righteous among the nations. These are the two uh, largest and best known studies. Uh, the Oliners wrote The Altruistic Personality, and they emphasize a very good point. There's no one single cause that uh, uh, explains, accounts for all the behavior of the righteous among the nations, but the closest thing to it is that they were influenced in close family relationships, something we've been talking about in this conference a lot, where parents encourage and model caring behavior and communicating caring values. Eva Folgeman, in her book, uh, Courage and uh, Conscience and Courage, she wasn't asking about this, but she started to expect it in every interview. So the take home message as far as is, is simply this. But I'm going to do something which I essentially never do in um, my classes, uh, is tell you that I've actually also taken a, a should position on this, in this case about what should I do, kind of if this uh, approach is true. And uh, as uh, Paul suggested, uh, hinted at at least, uh, I'm leaving the University of Missouri uh, to assist the Holocaust Museum and Education Center of Southwest Florida in Naples, Florida, uh, because they are expanding their museum dramatically and really want to expand their uh, 
exhibits and education about the righteous among the, Mer uh, among the nations. And one of the reasons I was so excited to come to Israel is that when I was doing that study of all the Muslim righteous rescuers in the town of Sarajevo, I discovered an organization called Gardens of the Righteous Worldwide. Okay? And this was an organization aimed at creating a garden of the righteous, kind of based on Yad Vashem, but including people from other genocides, from other situations. Okay? And uh, one of them happens to be in a community about halfway between here and Tel Aviv, known in English as Oasis of Peace, and in Hebrew, Wahad al Shlam. Okay? When I saw that they were starting a Garden of the Righteous, I said, yeah, I'm jumping at it, a chance. Because if anyone is going to try to use this insight into what causes human altruism in a potentially practical way, which I have said is good, I want to talk to these people. And how are they doing it? And they're including, just mentioned, some of the same cases from Yad Vashem, other cases particularly of Muslim and Arab rescuers who haven't made it into Yad Vashem, although they've been nominated, also ones from other genocides such as Armenians, not only Armenians who rescued Jews during the Holocaust, but Turks who rescued Jews from Turks, or who rescued Armenians from Turks during World War I. And any guesses who else they are including? More recent cases, Palestinians who have risked their lives to save Jews, and Jews who have recently risked their lives to save Palestinians. Do I really think this is going to create world peace? No, for one thing, there is no Garden of the Righteous in Sarajevo. They couldn't get people to agree. One of the people starting the organization was assassinated. So I think at best this could make a very small improvement, but it's the best thing I've come up with. So, thank you. Questions? Um, oh, go ahead. I, I, I reiterate the connection between um, the, the bottleneck yes. and altruistic behavior. Okay. If it's true, great question, that low reproductive success can be followed by high descendant leaving success. High, re high reproductive. No, low, having just, say, one offspring, yeah. saving a single life, yeah. okay, relatively low reproductive success. That can lead, as Yad Vashem emphasizes, to not just saving that individual's life, but over the next generations, large numbers of grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, etc. And if it's true that that can happen, then lowering reproductive success Kind of intentionally, not just it happens, but in certain situations, sacrificing your reproductive success can lead to, which is altruism, sacrificing, yeah. can lead to greater descendant leaving success. So it can actually be encouraged by traditions, that form of sacrifice, and not just happening now and then. So would these root networks be more in depth and thin, according to the diagram, or would they, for the same amount, be also wide? And if you're talking about scale of time and how many... Uh, I mean. It would be both. You could have that one offspring could... And you see these at Yad Vashem. The one person saved has three kids. Okay? They each have... One has four kids, one has two, one has six kids. They all show up. It's much more than just the individual. As time goes on, okay, that can even increase, I think by your analogy, broaden even more over time. And so, in contrast, those who are non altruistic, what happens to that root system? In, it's what the kind of all the blue triangles showed that you can end up under certain circumstances with greater numbers of descendants through sacrificing some along the way than just trying to maximize reproductive success. 
But then, but why does that other system, non-altruism, why does that harm that process? Like, why? What's, what happens? The picture the most common situation in humans: warfare. Yeah. Raiding back and forth. Okay. These people all kin over here versus these people who are kin to themselves over here. None of these people will be willing to take the risk in you know, some kind of suicide charge or something like that, okay? But s some of these people will. So they do on things that can kill many of the enemy, but they will lose their life, mm -hmm. okay? And their side will therefore win against that side. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, let me just add one more thing. <coughs> Anyone notice anything about uh, the righteous among the nations that doesn't fit? Because I forgot. That was my question. Okay, good. Thank you. Which is, of course, that the model you said about warfare is my group. Yes, yes, yes. And the righteous, the generals, is from outside group. He uses his, his Catholic Polish children or Ukrainian children to say Jewish children. Yes, and it has to be to be awarded. Yes. Okay. So usually when they talk about altruism, which is one of the big shticks always has been in, in evolutionary yes. social, in social biology, is the man throws himself on the hand grenade, he saves his fellow yes. uh, group members in this case. And the altruism has to be, in, in Righteous Among the Nations, non-Jew saving a Jew. That rules out kin selection and group selection. That's what I forgot to say. There's two things about the example of Yad Vashem that make me think it's more likely to have positive consequences. One is the altruism is not in the, towards the goal of killing. It's just in saving, which is unlike the, the more class, common ones. As in teaching, as a cultural experience, I agree with okay. you, but biologically speaking... Now let me, speaking, now let me, let me add the, the second one. The second one is, and this is just what I've got to say, is exactly that point. What the righteous among the nation shows is because this altruism is encouraged by cultural behavior, by talk, it doesn't have to stay limited to just kin. And this is actually not surprising. The actual age, the time when religion changed from this ancestor worship, just kin, to world religions that spread by Britain, that was able to do that because it's not based on, oh, I can tell you have my genes, I'll do this. It's because I have been told you are one of the people I should, and if you change what is said, if you say your, your neighbors, they're not your kin, but treat them as if they're kin, or start calling them kin, you can do that. What the righteous among the nation says is, although this form of altruism evolved by encouraging kinship relationship, it can be used you can change what is said, and you can get the same altruism towards non-kin. That's its power. That's what I forgot to, to that's emphasize. Culture. That's teaching. That's learning. That's not biology. Though. Ah, OK. First of all, just said, biology, hey, anyone know the meaning of the word biological? Study of? Study of life. Every living thing, yeah. tell me if I'm wrong, is the result of a complex interaction between genes and the environment. Okay? Part of what's in the environment of humans is the other people who influence them. So I suggest it's actually a false dichotomy between culture and biological, because saying something's biological just means it's living. And all living things are the product of genes interacting with the environment. Culture, the behavior of others that you might copy, that might let you do something or force you to do something is just part of the environment that interacts with genes to produce all aspects of all living things. That's why, this is one of the reasons I'm fringe, I think natural selection works on traditions. Also point out, Darwin didn't know about genes. He just knew that whatever interaction caused offspring to be more like their parents would be subject to natural selection. Yes. Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts. One, it sounds like we're making a distinction between consanguinity and what I like to call esoteric consanguinity. Right? So we can, we can, you know, we can be altruistic towards our siblings, but in, if you know the Christian community, they'll say we're all brothers and sisters in Christ when we're completely fictive kinship. Fictive kinship, esoteric consanguinity. The other thing I, wanted, I was thinking about is parent-offspring conflict. So you have an ancestor 
who will sacrifice an offspring, but that offspring, him or herself, could become the next ancestor. So it seems that at some point, someone's genetic line is, is going to sort of be pushed out of existence in perpetuity. What I would suggest is there's, there's always going to be a compromise to different degrees here, which I would suggest why you find in traditional societies the closest cooperation among the closest kin, and then it decreases, but it decreases far beyond the range where any shared genetics is responsible. And what causes the, the drop-off is the success of one link in the chain being particularly successful in fighting that resistance and encouraging more offspring there. So I think it accounts for what's known as segmentary organization or segmentary opposition. Yes? Surprisingly enough, there are some restrictions in the Jewish law uh, with regard to uh, sacrificing yes. sacrifice one's life, for, life for, others. For, for others because you should keep your life. And, and, I, and, and <clears throat> on the other hand, I agree with, with everything you said. It's something very deep in the culture to save love, to love your neighbors as yourself, to save others to prevent from killing and so on and so forth. So killing and also uh, um, prevent um, to um, restrain, uh, not to help others. Not to help others while, and, and watch them die while you, you, can, you can help. So uh, it's, it's, it's very interesting that you, we have both in our tradition. Am I right, again, I know very little, that there's been a debate over, the example I think used is you're in the desert, there's yeah. two of you. Right. There's only enough water to keep one alive. Right. Mm -hmm. Am I right? There's a debate right. that's been, do I keep myself alive and let the other die? Do I let myself die and let them, or do we split the water and, and both die? What I suggest is the fact that they're debating at that exact point is exactly what this predicts. Because the tradition should be value your sibling as much as yourself. Which means when it comes down to picking between that, it should be a really tough decision. That should be the line of debate, that treat your, your sibling or the other person you encourage as exactly equal as you. So what the debate is doing, well, what is you have to choose? It makes perfect sense that, that that's ex the point that should be, have been debated. I just, yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's true, but I want to, uh, the debate is of what, uh, there's not enough water for both of you, for both men, but uh, the, the argument is you should split the water so that you will not see your, your friend dying. This is new to me. Th thank you. Yes, this is this is the argument. Uh, but you know, uh, at the end, what is was accepted is that uh, the one with the water should keep the water to himself. But the, the argument is there, and 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 um, and uh, the, the reasoning is is very interesting. What would be a puzzle to me if the argument was, should I save two siblings or one? The fact that it's one for one is exactly, I think, consistent yeah. with, with this. But thank you for. Yes. The question is, I don't, you know, tell me more evolutionary theory, but is it not possible that it, it's a group thing? Like, because I, I, I see it's always like this different between individual and group. So if we go back to the Jewish rules of when one should give his life, so there is also this idea of giving your life not just for, uh, for others, but also for, to maintain the culture, for certain taboos that even that are, if you pass them, you're supposed to be willing to die and not pass those taboos, but more generally, the Talmud says that at certain times of grave danger, even on the smallest thing, you should be willing to give your life. And it's clear that in that situation, it's, it's not about the individual, it's about the uh, group. And that the, and, and group survives. The question is, isn't, can evolution in general be seen, and can humans be seen as ants? As, as, as ants that are interested not in the individual, but in the survival of the... Uh, like the new social ants, like what? a new social insect. That's yes, true. as as opposed, yes, so, and then and then that would answer a lot of questions because then it would, it would be in your case we wouldn't need to show that it's one branch and then out of that one branch you would get a lot. It's more it's more general that the group is willing to sacrifice some people so that other parts of it survive. It doesn't need to be direct genes descendants of that. One. Understand? My my, uh, I've, I've written extensively on group selection and problems with that. May the most relevant thing here I would say is. Individuals are empirical real 
they're, they're, they're there. Groups tend to be abstractions. They're really easy to talk about, but when you really get down to, to what is it, it's usually just a, a reified abstraction. And the examples you gave, you even... Everything was a peer What? Well, okay. Is it everything a reified abstraction? I would say no, you're not, an, and I'm not. Individuals, I'd say, are, are real. But that's just my... Our understanding of what we are, of me having one name, or me having an identity, and having to leaving the same person I am today as I am yesterday, of me being a doctor, or whatever that means, all that's reified... Uh, when I say that, that your talk about it, I can identify with my senses. I just point out that all the examples you gave that you then said were groups, you originally called them traditions, which is identifiable behavior passed from individuals. So at least consider the possibility that what we easily label as a group, like when you really point, what are you really experiencing? What can you really see? Are individuals reproducing and influencing the behavior of their offspring and then descendants? Yes, isn't that culture? Well, I don't know. I'm just Peter Berger, I'm sorry, it comes to, he comes to my mind very strongly now in the sacred town game. Isn't that culture that's passed down, it's created by a group of people. It's, it's, it's the result, whatever the tradition is that's passed down from parents to children, it wasn't created by those individual parents alone. It came into the world in the first place, it was created, you know, by tradition. Say most behaviors occur the first time by one individual. I don't know, we don't know how they occurred the first time. <laughs> that's a new behavior. Yes, but as Gertz would say, my understanding, you're, that behavior is only meaningful. A wink is only meaningful in a society in which the wink is understood by both sides. However, so a cultural wink that gives significance to the, behavior, the physical behavior in itself is meaningless. But if someone else did that, and then others started to do it, people would use the word culture to describe it without confusion or people objecting. If it would be meaning, and meaning is joint. Meaning is group. All right, but that's, I think, our long, too long a subject to solve here. Yes. <laughs> Just a couple of thoughts. First of all, um, I really, that was a challenging, wonderful talk. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll teach you another word of Hebrew. I know it's, it's that's challenging. You got this? <laughs> <laughs> get, get the computer going here. The word for culture in Hebrew is tarbut. Tarbut. I actually have looked that up. I okay. had no idea how to pronounce it. Tarbut. T A R B U T. T. Tarbut. Um, and it, 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 Hebrew is a root, like is based on three letter roots. And the, the third three letter root for tarbut is. Um, is reproduction. It's the same with culture, by the uh, way. And so we're very, right, so, you know, it's very clear, that, but we've lost that in both languages, that, that that's, the, that's the source of the word. In Arabic, by the way, they don't exist uh, in the same way. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so... Uh, I, I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, you know, so, but, but in, in Hebrew it's very clear, you know, that, that this, is, this is the place where, you know, re reproduction or, or multiplication is taking place. So my first comment. The second comment is, I, I'd like you to comment. Tradition versus continuity. And there's a difference. Um, in other words, that transmission um, of, of specific um, rituals, uh, behaviors, narratives, behaviors, all those things, um, they're called tradition, but but maybe um, I like it. What's the, because in my mind, tradition and kind there is change all the time. We live in environments that cause change. Uh, the recognition or the adaptation uh, is is that you know is that is that ability to adapt oneself. That's. That's, uh, you know, and I'd like to hear, you know, and, and okay. so that's, I would put that into the continuity rather than tradition and, and, and success, and I just would like you to comment on that. First of all, no two behaviors are exactly the same. So what the teacher, Lyle Stedman, that has influenced both Rick and myself, all of this comes from Lyle Stedman, would say that it's only to the extent that the behavior's the same. Is it traditional? Okay. So it's never perfectly the same. However, going back to the technology accelerated rate of change, you know, 20,000 years ago, the behaviors of how to make a stone tool didn't change much. 
now, I hear these things, I, are they called what, cell phones? I'm, I'm kind of, <laughs> I think they change a little bit faster. So it's like they're less traditional. Interesting, Darwin in his first version of the book did not use in the subtitle natural selection. He used the principle of preservation, emphasizing this continuity or this extent to be replicated identical, that yes, you can accumulate change, but what really, we often think that not the, the absence of change, the doing the same thing from one generation to the next, most Americans don't think, that's just what happens if you don't do anything. <laughs> Preservation takes effort. Mm -hmm. Does that help it? You know, little. I, I, a little. Yeah. <laughs> no, Nothing's exactly. No, I, was, I was actually I was thinking of an example. You know, and there's a there's a family, okay, that uh, has carries the surname of Rivlin. Okay, it is an Ashkenazic Jewish family, in which a person, uh, one individual in 1830 left Poland and came to Jerusalem. Okay. And there are. This is a family that's been tracked, and there are about 8,500 Rivlins in the world, and every single one traces their, themselves back. They live in 60 different countries. Um, they are religious, non-religious, some are now not Jewish, um, and yet there is a continuity. Of the name. Of, of the name, but also of a, con of a consciousness. Of a, is, was he successful, the, this original Rivlin? Uh, is that... Does that constitute evolutionarily I successful? If he, had, if he had stayed in Europe, but it's one of the few Ashkenazic Jewish families that was not affected at all by the Holocaust. I can answer that question, uh, assuming these names really only passed to descendants. From an evolutionary standpoint, yes, he was successful. From a moral judgment should position, don't look to me, is what I tell the students. It's like, does that make sense? But an evolutionary position, exactly. Now, what you just described is one behavior, speaking as a behavior, the name, that is descent names, or maybe the most important and unappreciated aspect of human existence to explain social behavior, because they identify kin. Okay? And they can't be accounted for by group selection or anything else, only by traditions. And it may be that only that name was passed on. There may be that name and a, a coat of arms or something. It may be that name and some other behavior. Okay, but that's what I mean by to the extent. You know that the name what you just described is traditional. Now you might get little changes in. That's why I thought you were going to say is in spelling and pronunciation. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that there are changes, they're not traditional. Mm -hmm. So it's only to the extent that they continue. Mary, you'll see the crack over dinner tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, thank you.